Hi, my name is Brian Kim, and I'm from the UC Irvine Sports Medicine Fellowship. And this is part of the Family Medicine Radiology Educational Series. We'll be talking about common stress fractures, and I have no disclosures. So our objectives for this are pretty straightforward. We'll be reviewing three important stress fractures in adults and their radiographic appearance. In general, if you're looking for stress fractures, you want to get at least two views. An AP and lateral will often suffice, uh, but you can throw in an oblique view as well for a third view. And the more views you order will just increase your chances of finding that fracture and also to rule out artifact. Because if you see an abnormality on just one view that you don't see on other views, um, that may just be an artifact and not a true finding. So the terms stress fracture and insufficiency fracture are um, sometimes used interchangeably. Um, and for definitions, you know, stress fractures are generally uh, those that result from an abnormal load on a normal bone, whereas insufficiency fractures result from normal load on abnormal bone, like in the case of osteoporotic fractures. It is also important to know that bone stress injury is the umbrella term and a stress fracture is the pathologic endpoint of that process. There are lesser degrees of bone stress injury. Uh, these are generally graded only on an MRI. So if you do get an MRI of a bone stress injury, um, there are grading systems out there and the most common ones will grade them on a scale of one to four with four being a complete stress fracture. So we'll be seeing examples of these in the cases that follow and we'll make sure to point out the hallmark findings on x-ray. And these are the locations that we'll be looking at. There certainly are many other places where you can get a stress fracture, but these are important ones uh, that you're gonna be familiar with uh, evaluating in the clinic. So typical stress fractures are very common. Um, and I think most people will know the story, you know, mid to distal shin pain that might start insidiously and worsen or become more focal. People often present initially and be diagnosed with shin splints and may present with persistent or worsening symptoms, which may increase the suspicion for tibial stress fracture. Um, you will also have an increased suspicion if someone's in a weight-bearing sport or uh, marching in the military. These are all also high-risk conditions. On exam, you'll have tenderness in the mid to distal posterior medial aspect of the tibial shaft, and they may present with some bony irregularity, uh, but not in all cases. And certainly symptoms at the anterior tibia should raise the suspicion for a much more serious type of injury, which would be anterior tibial stress fracture, which is something we'll encounter in just a few slides from now. On this AP view of the proximal tibia and fibula, we see a few abnormal findings, uh, the most obvious of which is an obliquely oriented linear lucency through the medial tibial cortex. Additionally, there is subtle thickening of the cortex in this region, uh, as well as some bone marrow changes um, in, in density, where it appears hyperdense in this region. Uh, although that's not a really common finding, I would say the lucencies and the thickening of the cortex are going to be the more common findings on radiographs. On this lateral view, we also see a thickening of the cortex, in this case, the posterior cortex, uh, with a linear lucency in this region as well. This is that important variation that you certainly don't want to miss. Uh, and this is an anterior tibial stress fracture. People will call it the dreaded black line because that's what you see on the lateral radiograph of the tibia. Uh, and that's what we have here on the right side of the picture. This is a lateral view of the tibial shaft. And as you can see, there is a thin black line arising from the anterior tibial cortex. Um, Interestingly, if you just had the left sided picture, which is an AP view of the tibia, you wouldn't necessarily know that it was affecting the anterior cortex. So another reason why it's important to have multiple views um, to support your diagnosis. And the reason why these are so important not to miss is because the treatment is different. Um, it, with regular tibial stress fractures, you can perform some degree of weight bearing on it. But for these anterior tibial cortex ones, you want to be completely non-weight bearing and some of these will go to a surgery because of the decreased potential for healing. 
If the x-ray is indeterminate and you still have increased clinical suspicion, MRI is generally going to be the next step. And as we discussed, it not only shows complete stress fractures, uh, grade four, but can show you lesser grades, grades one through three. Um, and the table below shows one example of grading system, and this is the Fredrickson classification, which is a commonly uh, used classification system. And the pictures on the right just demonstrate on both um, T1 and on the left, T2 fluid sensitive images, um, examples of bone marrow edema that would be consistent with um, a bone stress injury. So the treatment's pretty straightforward. You know, if they're having pain ambulating, um, putting them in a walking boot and crutches, and if they can walk okay without too much pain, you can take them off the crutches and progress them from the walking boot to something like this pneumatic compression brace uh, pictured on the right here. Um, during this time, even though they're not running, they can perform non-weight bearing exercises such as pull running, which may help to um, maintain cardiovascular fitness. Uh, and there are various different strategies as far as a return to running program in your competitive athletes. But I provided one example of a table below of a four week running program um, starting gradually uh, and increasing week to week. Our next injuries are the metatarsal stress fractures. These are also very common. Um, similar types of athletes are gonna be prone to these. Runners, uh, weight bearing athletes, uh, and military personnel as well too. And they'll present with dorsal foot pain. Um, there may be some swelling involved as well too. And multiple metatarsals may be affected or um, tender on clinical exam. On this AP image of the foot, we see a classic fluffy, almost cotton candy-like density surrounding the metatarsal shaft. And this indicates a periosteal reaction, which is a classic sign of a stress fracture. If you're able to zoom in, um, there is a subtle linear lucency at the tibial shaft as well too, which is consistent with a fracture line. Though this may not always be seen, the periosteal reaction itself may be enough for you to diagnose a stress fracture. This is another patient where you see a similar periosteal reaction, as well as some lucencies that are consistent with a stress fracture of the second metatarsal shaft. Now, one potential pitfall when it comes to metatarsal injuries is a proximal end of the metatarsal. As you can see on the x-ray, there's a lot of overlap and shadowing of bones in this region, which can make it very difficult to detect a fracture, especially subtle ones. So in this instance, an MRI was done and it revealed significant bone marrow edema at the base of the metatarsal, consistent with the bone stress injury. So again, if the x-ray is indeterminate, you can get an MRI to evaluate for occult stress fractures. Uh, but it, in addition to that, it can also demonstrate multiple stress fractures, even if uh, radiographs may only indicate one. And that's important because um, both with traumatic and stress fractures of the metatarsal, um, it's very easy to have multiple fractures, um, especially the, the second, third, and fourth metatarsals. As far as treatment for these um, metatarsal stress fractures, you know, if they have pain with ambulation, uh, you might consider crutches initially. Many people are okay going straight into a post-op shoe, um, and that's going to decrease the movement of the forefoot and make it more comfortable to bear weight. Um, and that's because these generally heal very well. Um, excellent healing potential for four to eight weeks. Lastly, we'll talk about probably the most consequential stress fractures, and that's the femoral neck stress fractures. Um, clinically, these are most common in active females, um, presenting with anterior hip pain and worse weight bearing. <coughs> there is a strong association with distance running, uh, leanness sports, uh, including weight class sports, and eating disorders or disordered eating. So that's where you know, a good history, asking about components of the female athlete triad will be helpful. Uh, physical exam findings may be vague, so imaging may be your best guess in a lot of these cases. Here we have an AP of the pelvis, uh, and then uh, on the right side, zooming in an AP of the left hip as well. And you may not see any abnormalities initially, 
Um, but if you look closely at the, the base of the femoral neck, there's a linear sclerotic line right there. Um, you know, there's no lucency indicating an actual fracture line, but there's a little bit of an abnormality there that does um, warrant further investigation, especially in the context of symptoms like anterior hip pain or leg pain or thigh pain. Uh, so if there was any uh, suspicion and the x-ray was not definitive, an MRI would be the next step. This is another example. Um, on the left, this person actually had a normal x-ray on their first time being seen. Subsequently, one month later, there was a clear fracture line. Um, and so there was a progression of these symptoms with the ongoing weight-bearing activity. And as you can see on the picture on the far right, the fracture line persisted at three months, although there is some evidence of healing um, on these x-rays. An important distinction to make in your diagnosis of femoral neck stress fractures um, is if they are uh, tension-sided or compression-sided. Um, so the previous two examples were compression-sided stress fractures, those arising from the inferior femoral neck. This is an example of one arising from the superior side, which is the tension side. So, you know, we call it that because it's under more tension. And as you can imagine, there's um, a poorer healing potential as well, too. So these should be taken very seriously. Uh, increased rates of progression to complete fracture, non-healing or poor healing. So these should generally be referred to your colleagues in orthopedic surgery, and you should make sure that you send them with crutches and completely non-weight bearing. Particularly with femoral neck stress fractures, x-rays may miss um, early stress fractures or bone stress injuries. And additionally, in those of your patients with significant arthritis, um, the arthritic changes, the bone spurs, the sclerosis may actually obscure findings on radiographs as well. So in any, any of these situations, um, axial imaging with CT or MRI can be done if there is suspicion for a stress fracture that the x-ray is not diagnostic. As far as treatment for the femoral neck stress fractures, you can treat compression sided uh, stress fractures um, that are mild, non weight bearing on crutches. Although those that are uh, with a fracture line greater than 50% of the femoral neck width, you should refer, as well as all tension sided stress fractures because of their um, increased risk of non healing or uh, progression to completion. So, in summary, take a great history, um, ask for any training volume or errors. Ask about signs or symptoms of the female athlete triad as well too, or male athlete triad if appropriate. There are a lot of subtle changes in x-ray um, that may not be apparent at first glance, but look carefully, zoom in, uh, talk to your radiologist if you can get them on the phone as well too. And if there is any doubt and persistent clinical suspicion, you know, go ahead and order that MRI or CT. Um, and certainly do not miss stress fractures of the anterior tibia and the femoral neck.